Hello there, friends. Welcome again to Grace Baptist Church. This is our Sunday evening service. This is coming up here on December the 5th. December the 5th. Sunday evening. We appreciate you tuning in. We're looking at a passage that we preached from Wednesday night, continuing it tonight. How to enjoy Christmas this year? How do we enjoy it this year? We don't want it to become a rat race. We don't want it to be a stressed out holiday. No, we want it to be a blessing. We want it to be a help. And if you have your Bible, turn with me. First John chapter number four, seven through 14. First John chapter number four, seven through 14. How to enjoy Christmas. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right before we get started. Father, we come today. We ask your blessings upon us as we study the Bible. Teach us things about Christmas that will help us to enjoy it even more, Lord. You've been so good to us, and we just thank you for it. Bless those listening, those who are watching by the means of internet. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, last week we talked about demonstrate the love of God. Demonstrate the love of God. John says here in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So what's John saying? Well, John is saying one of the true marks of a Christian is that they have love one for another. Then he goes on and talks a little bit here in the next verse, when you read verse number eight, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And so someone may profess to be a Christian, but only those who display God's love possess that divine nature. Those are the ones who are truly born again. And so the person that has no love in their heart really shows a lack of the Lord in their life. Because if you have the Lord, you're going to have love. He's going to pour his love inside of you. And thank God for that. But then we also see here that if we demonstrate the love of God, number two, we need to also, if we're going to enjoy our Christmas, we need to rejoice in the salvation of God. Rejoice in the salvation of God. Oh, thank God for his love for us, that he was willing to come down, die on that old rugged cross, be buried and rose again so that we could be saved. We see that in verse number nine. It says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Christmas means so much more to all of us when we come to know the salvation of the Lord. We know the true meaning of Christmas is Jesus Christ and his birth. I enjoy the Christmas trees. I love to see the beautiful lights, the Christmas carols, the songs, the parades, the cantatas, giving and receiving gifts, the delicious food we all enjoy. These are wonderful things in Christmas. But we also know that the true meaning of Christmas has nothing to do with that. The true meaning of Christmas is that Jesus Christ came down to this earth, was born to die on a cross, and I am so glad that he willingly went to that cross for all of us. He didn't have to, but he chose to. I read a story once of a chaplain. This chaplain was going through a hospital ward speaking to soldiers that had been wounded in battle. He walked by one soldier who was lying in a car there in the hospital, he noticed the young man had lost his right arm. The chaplain thought he would try to say a word of encouragement to him. And so he walked over to him and said, Son, you've lost an arm for a great cause. And the soldier smiled and said, Chaplain, you're wrong. I didn't lose this arm. I gave it. <laughs> and he did give it. And friends, Jesus didn't lose his life. He gave his life so that we could be free. You don't have to have a whole lot of gifts to be happy this Christmas. I was going through the line in the K&W not long ago and several policemen right behind me. Now, of course, you can know I was on my best behavior. <laughs> but they were laughing, they were joking, and one of them asked the server who was getting out the food, says, what do you want for Christmas this year? And 
The lady said, all I want is love. All I want is love for Christmas. Friends, the good news is you already have that precious gift. You have the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He did that for you because he loved you. Jesus proved how much he loved us by allowing them to torture him and crucify him. He could have said enough's enough and wiped them off the face of the earth, but he didn't do that, did he? He could have turned that old cross into a missile and said, I'm getting out of here, or a rocket and just went back to heaven. But he didn't do that. He stood on that cross and stayed on that cross. And he said, it is finished. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he departed from there and gave up the ghost, the Bible said. He died for you. He died for me. Think about all that he went through. I mean, they hit him. They scourged him. They pulled his beard out. They put a crown of thorns into his head. Now, I'm not the God of the universe, but if I was and they were doing that to me, I would be tempted to strike back. But he didn't strike back. Thank God he went all the way to demonstrate how much he loves us here at Christmas time. You don't have to travel around the world to be happy at Christmas. You don't really have to have the most decorations in the neighborhood <laughs> to be happy at Christmas time. There's a great principle that will help you in Christmas. And I know sometimes Christmas can be a lonely time when we lost loved ones. That first Christmas is awful hard. But I like what Hebrews 13 verse number five says. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content, he says. Be content with such things as you have. For he, Jesus, has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So he's already promised he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. He'll go with us every step of the way, even during this Christmas season. So we're to live our lives without trying to covet what others have or desire what somebody else gets for Christmas. Hey, just rejoice. If they get something nice, thank God for that. If you get something nice, thank God for that. You don't get a whole lot, that's okay too. God's been good to us. We'd all have to admit he's been better to us than we've been to him. When I was a little boy, I can still remember not far from where I grew up. Now, there were two or three houses always trying to outdo each other with the Christmas lights and the decorations. And everybody would come from near and far to see oh, what so-and-so got this year. What so-and-so got? How much have they added since last year? And it went on and on and on. And I saw those lights every year as a little boy. Never forgot it. It was a blessing to me. But as I thought about it, I said, really, the whole meaning of Christmas was not those lights. Although that added to the joy of Christmas. I love to see the lights because, you know, the light reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. But then again, I thought, how many of those lights do I still remember? I can't even recall a single decoration. All I can remember, there were some lights out there. And uh, how many gifts can you remember that you got last year? Yeah, I mean, so many times we get it, we open it up out of the box, we mess with it for a little bit, and then pretty soon it's set on the shelf somewhere. And we forgot what we even had for Christmas. Well, I'll tell you one gift. I'll tell you one gift that you will be glad that you got. And that's the gift of God's Son. He willingly died for you. He willingly was buried. And he willingly rose from the dead. <laughs> I heard about a lady. She had three sons that wanted to prove they were the best son. Each one of them decided they was going to get mom a real nice Christmas gift. So one year for Christmas, the three sons were trying to outdo each other. One of the sons bought her a 15-room mansion. Another son bought her a beautiful Mercedes and a chauffeur to drive her around in. Well, the third son, he bought her a trained talking parrot, a bird that could talk. And 
the special feature this bird has is that he had been trained for more than 15 years to memorize the entire Bible. And that parrot could quote scripture from Genesis to Revelation. You could ask him about to quote any verse in the Bible and it would quote it word for word. So he thought, boy, this will outdo both of my brothers. They'll never think of a gift like this. A talking parrot that has memorized the whole Bible. <laughs> well, the mother appreciated all the gifts, but she called the first son. She said, son, that house is just gorgeous, but it's really too much for me. And it's just too much for me to clean and take care of. But I do appreciate it. And then the second son she called and said, son, I want to say that car is beautiful. It has everything you could ever want on it. But I don't drive, and I really don't like the driver too much. <laughs> then she called the third son. And she said, son, I just want to thank you for the most thoughtful gift this Christmas. That was the best chicken I've ever eaten. Oh, no. <laughs> she done taken the talking parrot and turned him into a chicken. Well, friends, this verse is teaching us we can enjoy our lives this Christmas. Why? Look again at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. We might live through him. And so we enjoy our lives. We enjoy Christmas this year, not because we have the most presents under the trees, but because we have the Christ of Christmas in our lives. And he never grows old. He never breaks down. He never leaves us. We never stick him on the shelf. If we do, we get in trouble. He wants our attention, our allegiance. He stays with us all the time. And one day he will, or, he will escort you into the splendors of heaven. Jesus Christ will. And so listen to this wonderful Christmas verse. Matthew 1, verse number 21. Matthew 1, 21 says, In reference to Mary, She shall bring forth a son, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, For he shall save his people from their sins. Have you been saved from your sins? You may be watching me this evening and say, what am I supposed to be saved from? Well, friends, the Bible teaches that we're saved from our sins. We have all sinned. And the Bible said we've come short of the glory of God. And as a result of that sin, the penalty for it is hell. Dying without Jesus Christ, going to a literal hell forever and forever. And the good news of Christmas is that Mary brought forth a little baby whose name was Jesus to save us all from our sins and to save us from a terrible place called hell. And when we come to know Jesus, he takes all of our sins upon himself and he swaps with us and gives us his very own righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? Instead of standing before God with all of those terrible things that we've done in the past, we get to stand before God with a perfect record. Not one sin will be on our account. Why? All of this was erased because of that very first Christmas gift 2,000 years ago when God the Father gave God the Son to be the Savior of the world. Come to Christ. You'll never regret it. Look again at our text, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. How do we know that God loves us? He sent his only begotten son. That very first Christmas. So now we can enjoy eternal life through him. Notice verse number 10 here, 1 John 4, verse 10. Herein is love, not be, that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world. Have you ever received him as your savior? 
If you hadn't, I'd encourage you to do so. By human nature, we don't really love God to start with. We've all been born with a sin nature. It came through our ancestors, Adam and Eve. They ran from God. They ate of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. They were separated from God. And they passed that sin down to us. And this verse is teaching us that God loved us first. God came looking for us, just like he did with Adam and Eve. They tried to hide, but you cannot hide from God. And God loved them so much, he went looking for them. And God loves you and me so much, he came looking for us. All because of that very first Christmas. So the good news this Christmas, God loves you. He's looking for you. He loved you first. He sent Jesus to be the propitiation. The word propitiation means to appease. It means to render favorably. So that's a pagan meaning of the word. The pagan worshiper, they all brought gifts to their false gods, trying to appease the wrath of their false gods and make him favorable to them. But the God of Christianity, think about it. He needs no gifts to appease his wrath and make him favorable to the human race. Divine love comes from his heart. His wrath against sin cannot be placated by good works. It cannot be washed away by doing right. Only by trusting Christ that we can have our sins forgiven. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 5 translates a form of this word as the mercy seat. Christ literally became our mercy seat and the holy of holies, the high priest would splatter the blood of the sacrifice on the day of atonement. And Christ did this when he bled and died, spilled his blood on that holy sacrifice of heaven. He satisfied the demands of a holy God. God is so holy he cannot look on sin. God is so holy he cannot allow sin into heaven. So what did God do? He sent his son who died and shed his blood. And now that blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven and God's wrath has been satisfied. Oh, the righteousness of God has been satisfied by the sacrifice and the shedding of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If we find ourselves feeling empty or sad this Christmas, let's go back to that little manger. Let's focus on the fact that that little baby was the satisfaction to God's holiness, to God's righteousness, so that we could be forgiven of our sins and so that we could have eternal life in heaven. Amen. Glory to God, that's enough to bring some joy. That's enough to bring some happiness into the hearts of God's people. If you really want to have a wonderful Christmas, demonstrate your love to every person you meet and rejoice in the salvation God has given you because he loved you first. We'll stop right there. We'll finish it up Wednesday night. I do appreciate you tuning in. And if you're going to have a wonderful Christmas, what do we need to do? Number one, rejoice in the salvation of God. Then number two, we must always show forth the love of God in our hearts. Let other people know, hey, God loves you just like he loves me. And when you show the love of God, it has a way of melting that heart and letting them know that you love them and that you care about them. So demonstrate the love of God. Rejoice in the salvation of God. We'll get into one more on Wednesday night. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had to come together to look at a passage of scripture, to think about the coming of Christ that first Christmas 2,000 years ago. Bless each person, Lord, that's listening to the sound of my voice, and I pray that they would make that most important decision to come to Christ for salvation, for it's in his name we pray, amen and amen. Friends, thank you again for tuning in. I hope you have a great week. We'll be back Wednesday night, Lord willing, seven o'clock.
Until then, may the Lord richly bless you.